Hello booktube, this is a recent reads video. If you're new here and you've not seen one of these, this is a sort of a chilled out, more chatty video where I talk about every book that I've read since the last time I did one of these videos. And there's generally just a bit of discussion and stuff about anything I feel like. There's a life update and all of that sort of stuff. So if that is not of interest to you, if you're just here for the books, I'm gonna put a timestamp in the description and you can just fast forward to that point. Been a long time since I did one of these and I have quite a few books to discuss. I've got 19 books. Eight of them were DNFs. The reason there are so many books is that I stopped making these videos while I was reading the books for my reading booktuber's favourite books of 2022 video. I didn't want to double discuss them so none of those books are going to be on this video. So there's a few things that have happened to me this week. Tuesday was Nell's birthday and we went out and we saw some art at the National Gallery of Victoria and we just had a great day a great day out we went to the Jewish Museum in St Kilda I didn't realize how much Jewish history I was viewing through the eyes of white people and to learn about them from their own perspective and their history from their own perspective was absolutely fascinating it was a bit information overload for me I kind of wanted to have a notebook so I could just take down events that I'm like find a YouTube video for this or look this up on Wikipedia the two ways I get information because there, there were just so many interesting things part of the history of Israel where they go into other countries and they free the Jews from those countries and bring them back to Israel I wanted to find out what what, what exactly was going on there it was that was eye-opening and then we were going to go to the St Kilda Botanical Gardens but we thought it'd be a really good place to read a book so we went to hyena and hare or hare and hyena i never get them confused but n not the animals just the a queer bookshop in st kilda and they're wonderful and now got a book from there and we just sort of sat in this really lovely garden in the middle of st kilda and the other bit of personal news that i think i would like to update you on is that i am now enrolled i've been accepted in and i'm enrolled in a masters of information studies which is a course to become a librarian, to start a new career at this age is um, a little bit daunting, but really exciting. So that's what's going on in my life. I want to have a little meta conversation about BookTube. I want to I want to preface this by saying that this is not a complaint. This is not a whinge. That overall, I think that in general, I do better than average with things on BookTube, and I'm pretty happy with with everything. The work we put into videos and what we expect the videos to to do and so lately i've been putting like a, a a bit more effort into to the videos i have made but one of the last videos i dropped was i think the best video i've ever made and it's the video that i put the most work into it took me over six months now obviously i wasn't doing it full time obviously it didn't it wasn't six months of 40 hour weeks it wasn't even six months of an hour here an hour there some of those months i didn't progress this video at all and and a lot of that was me not liking what I was doing and not giving up on the idea, but scrapping everything I'd done and starting again. But even with all of that taken into account, I still think the video I made about Moby Dick is the most work I've put into a booktube video. The most research, the most scripting, the most editing. I think I've discovered something really cool. I wasn't so silly to think that a video about such a small topic would be popular. We know if you, we do single book reviews, they don't do as well as most of the other content on on booktube we know that that shrinks our our audience that if you're only talking about one book only the people interested in that book will watch your videos but that's not the only stat i look at i mean everybody sort of talks about views but what really disappointed me about this video was that i expected that my retention would be quite high on it for it to be one of those videos that hangs around and keeps getting you know a couple of views a day and in 12 months time it's one of your best performing videos one of those videos and it is the lowest retention of any video I have made in the last 12 months. As a general rule, I, I say retention rate 50% is sort of the bar. Short video, you want to get a bit higher. Longer video, that, that's not gonna, you're not going to get 50%. You know, my Moby Dick video is not even at 30%. And most of that is like immediate drop off. Most of that is like below 50% retention in the first 15 seconds. Why? Like... <laughs> It just sort of comes back to this idea that 
your videos don't matter anywhere near as much as your title and your thumbnail and the idea that you're talking about. And I have videos that I've put relatively little work into that I get complimented on that bring in subs and it seems so mismatched. The other thing is if you ask viewers the sort of videos that they want, in general, you'll get a lot of people saying, I want you to do more single book reviews. I want you to do deep dives and analysis. And I think people love that sort of stuff, but it doesn't get the views. It's not the party trick. I think that people are really disconnected with the sort of media that they want to view. They might remember an excellent book review, but most of the time people are probably on booktube at a time when their brain is a little bit too tired to read and they want mindless content. So tag videos and TBRs are much more popular maybe. I'm not, I'm not having a go by the way. I just find it fascinating. A video that I can put relatively minimal effort in can get 10 times the views and get me new subs and get me lots of wonderful comments and lots of subscribers. But when I try as hard as I can, and, and sure, I could have made that video even better. You know, I'm, I'm always learning with my video making how to improve things. It blows my mind. It's sort of like when you realize just how much richer Mark Zuckerberg is than your average teacher or bricklayer or accountant. It feels like the work to reward ratio is so out. This is a really long winded way of saying that I have put a lot of effort into figuring out whether Queequeg and Ishmael from Moby Dick were friends or lovers. I think you should all watch it, but maybe you're not interested in Moby Dick. I have 19 books to discuss with you. A lot of them are DNF. I over borrowed from the library and instead of making what would have been an arbitrary decision on which books to just return unread, I decided that I would I would just DNF hard. I always figure with a DNF, I can still read it. It's not a DNF forever. A, a good review or the right sort of good review and, and I can give that book another shot. Sometimes it's just a matter of whittling down. It's almost no different to you going and looking at 20 books and going, well, I can only pick three. Which ones are really calling my name? And sometimes the books that sound the dullest are actually the best. Anyway, onto the DNFs. Trust by Lydia Yankovic. There's just too many changes of perspective in this book and there was nothing that really made me buy into anything. Like I, I couldn't, I, I didn't buy into the characters of the plot or what was happening. I just, I needed to invest in something. I really appreciate that Lydia Yankovic is doing something quite interesting here. She's creating a portrait of the US, where it's come from, who built it, where it's going. She's discussing slavery. She's discussing the future of the United States, but she's included time travel magical realism, dystopian, historical fiction, speculative fiction. There is so much going on. I am so divided when I'm reading this book and I'm just spread to thin. I never knew what genre I was reading. I never knew what character was going to pop up. I didn't know how these characters fit together. It just started to feel like noise. I can see why it's getting positive reviews, but stylistically it doesn't work for me. She needed to calm down. Jamaica Inn by Daphne de Marie. This is part of the FOMO book club run by Alice, Gemma and Jack, all excellent booktubers who I'm sure you're all subscribed to and watch regularly and love because because you have good taste in booktube, that's why you're here. Daphne de Marie is an author who I have read two books prior to Jamaica in, Rebecca and My Cousin Rachel. Both of those books are quite similar, both combine intrigue with great character portraits, and they're very satisfying, they're very literally satisfying to read. And Jamaica Inn is doing something different. It's not, it's not Rebecca, it's not My Cousin Rachel, it's not that style of book. It's just a mystery. It's probably very good, but it really wasn't what I wanted to read. It's just trying to do something different to what I was in the mood for reading. I predicted this would make the Woman's Prize long list. I am not sure I still predict that. River Sing Me Home by Eleanor Shearer. I really wanted to love this book, a Jamaican novel about a woman who, after slavery ends in Jamaica, tracks down or tries to track down her children who were, you know, sold off and traded. But I just didn't really connect with this. The writing didn't work for me and I felt quite distant from the characters. And this is like an emotional novel and I should be emotionally connecting with the mother at the very least. And it just didn't happen. I will say there's a lot of positive reviews out there for this one. So potentially that's just me. The Piano Tuner by Chan Sen Ku. I could have finished this book. It wasn't bad, but also 
there was no reason to finish it. It was a story about a widower who was a piano tuner. They don't earn the respect or the money or the, you know, the prestige that the the big piano soloists do. But they're just as important to the experience. I just feel like I've summarised that book and everything that book was saying and demonstrating in less than 60 seconds. Foreign Circle by Maxine Benba Clark. I didn't realise that this was a collection of short stories until after I'd finished the third book. The third story, rather. I was beginning to wonder how many timelines, how many different narratives this book was going to have and how these characters were all linked together. The first three stories were in Melbourne, London and Kingston. And when I realised that they were short stories and not introductions to characters, I was so disappointed because that was not a satisfying ending. I thought, this is just a small event in this character's life to, to introduce them. And I don't feel like a short story should feel like that. The prose was great and I would read another Maxine Benba Clark, but I, I would really hope that it was a novel. Little Miseries by Kimberly Olsen Fakik, a memoir which she goes to great lengths to say isn't a memoir. And when she was a child, her family went to a log cabin or a holiday of some sort that feels like a log cabin in the wilderness. And she did a lot of work bringing stuff in from the car and putting stuff away and, and was really underappreciated, even though she did that work without being asked. We're a third of the way into the book at this point, And that's what's happened. And I just did not care. I really didn't. I struggled to invest in that character. I didn't care when whether she was loved by her parents or not. It seems harsh to say that I didn't care about a child, but I didn't. Scatterlings, I just couldn't get into this novel. I don't really remember much about it. Body Grammar by Jules Oman. This is the second book I DNF that I predicted would make the Woman's Prize long list. That's kind of a bit embarrassing for my predictions video, really, but I predicted way too many books. We can have a couple of failures, can't we? This is meant to be a lesbian romance in the fashion industry. Androgyny was thrown in the to the description too, so I thought we might have a little bit of gender exploration. I wasn't sure. Lots of potentials, but I didn't like the prose. So onto the books that I finished. Have Two, An Heir and a Spare. Whoa me, it must be so hard to be Prince Harry. I've already done a single book review of Spare by Prince Harry and I really regret reading this book. I really regret making that video and I'm going to be honest with you here and tell you why I shouldn't have done it. This is not really my wheelhouse. I do read memoir. I do like memoir. It's not my preferred genre but it is a genre that I do read quite a bit from and my most popular video is a single book review of Jeanette McCurdy's book I'm Glad My Mum Died. And I looked at this and I'm like, wow, Prince Harry's famous. This book is going to go gangbusters. And it, it has. I got that part right. And I thought that this would be a good chance to grow my channel and that my review video would do quite well. And that was a very bad call. Because while the McCurdy video, while that's sort of on the edge of what I would read, that's still just a book I would read. About childhood abuse, that's totally me. And the video that I made has actually lost me more subscribers than it has gained me. But then the conversation it created as well. It's, oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. People are really angry. They're really angry. And they're like angry that I'm not angry enough at Prince Harry. That I didn't say that he is biased. But, you know, it's a memoir. I, I kind of like, whose side did you you expect him to take and I thought that I called him out in my review for not learning from his past errors and and said that it's clear that he was still a racist but I was too generous of him in my path there maybe I don't know anti Harry comments and felt like I wanted to defend Prince Harry and basically I don't want to defend Prince Harry he's a rich bourgeois dickhead that's had a really privileged life and he's incapable of seeing the common person in his book and he kind of knows that he kind of like he he knows that but he he only knows that intellectually the book itself was interesting as a character portrait of a flawed man who wants to hide that he's flawed with regards to the drama i don't find it particularly hard to believe most of what Prince Harry is saying, really. The media are completely unscrupulous and dangerous. Yeah, I, I can believe that. The media will do anything for a dollar. Yeah, I can believe that. If this is an argument about who to hate more, Prince Harry or Rupert Murdoch, I'm telling you, there's not too many people I would hate more than Rupert Murdoch. Put him against Hitler and I'd have to think about it. That That is a bit harsh, but Rupert Murdoch is an absolute
absolutely horrible human and I could think of few people that the human race would be better off without right now than than Rupert Murdoch. Does that make Harry a nice person? Does that make him a good person? I know I, I think that makes him a narcissist who has a pudding instead of a brain. There's definitely racism within the royal family. How long ago did Prince Philip die? There's definitely problematic behavior inside the royal family. I mean, I mean, Prince Andrew is not in jail for being a, a nonce. And people are upset about Megan. I, I feel like if you're angry at Harry and Megan, you're angry at the wrong royals, is, is really all I can say. Suppose you could be angry at Harry and Megan and be angry at the other royals. Greek Lessons by Hang Kang. I got this as an arc. Thank you, NetGalley. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate the publisher, who I didn't look up before this video. Go organization, Scott. I'm very grateful that I got a chance to read this. Now that all said, don't waste your hard-earned money on this book. This is just not the same team that wrote The Vegetarian. I refuse to believe that. This is uh, terrible. It's needlessly abstract. It's overly jumpy. There are too many changes in narrative style that are they're just too quick and too short. And the characters, this is absurd. We have a blind German man and a mute Korean lady, and they're barely distinguishable on the page. Or we have a man who is regretting leaving his family or not regretting leaving his family. We have a woman who's been separated from her son. Kang is having a literary conversation about the shape of language and communication and connection. And I like that. It is the saving grace of this book. But the nicest thing I can really say about this is that the execution didn't match the vision of this one. Violets by Shin Kyung Suk. I often wonder with translated literature how the original language affects a novel. Not that the author could really change that. In most cases, couldn't change that. And I doubt the author really gives much thought to it being translated into English when they, they write it. Korean often translates into sparse, simple but very accurate prose. It's super digestible and it can be quite literary at the same time. It, it's it's really good mostly. It is ideally suited to political critiques, but I do wonder if a reflective ambient novel such as Violets would have hypothetically been better if it was translated from German or French or a different language. And it felt like Anton Hoyer, the translator, who was a, a legendary translator, by the way, it felt like his vision of this lacked the boldness that it, it needed for this novel to work. And maybe maybe that would have deviated too much from the original text. I'm just being hypothetical here, but this book didn't work for me. And, and it, there does seem to be a disconnect between the the language that was used in this novel and the language that should have been used. This is about a woman who quits hairdressing and gets a job selling flowers. Uh, there's a host of characters who vaguely interact with the text, which is a really vague thing to say if you think about it, Scott. There's this really creepy man in it who seems very demanding, and I thought that this would be an interesting demonstration of toxic masculinity, but it just didn't go there quite enough. It sort of left you to do quite a lot of work for how the characters would have felt. And I I just wanted to be immersed. I wanted to, like, was she feeling uncomfortable? Was she feeling unsafe? Everything just felt a little bit cold and a little bit matter of fact. The Furrows by Namweli Sapali. Another one I predicted for the Woman's Prize long list. Another one that I wouldn't have put on there if I had read it prior to that video. What is this novel doing? Like, I feel like 10% of you are going to unconditionally love this book and the other 90% of you are literally going to say, what? Why? How? No. And, and I'm, I'm I'm one of those. Cassandra's brother Wayne died from drowning, but Cassandra passed out before this happened. She didn't see it. Her white mother doesn't accept that it happened. Her black father reacts very differently. Years later, Cassandra finds herself attracted to a man called Wayne, and we follow their relationship with 
flashbacks. There's a lot of discussion about racism and belonging. I really just don't think I truly understood this book. When I don't understand a book, I normally would just sit with it for a bit and think about it and go through, well, what what don't you understand? What could that mean? I can come up with an interpretation and that interpretation might not be right, but I go from not understanding it to getting something out of the book. And in this book, I just didn't like it enough. It wasn't magnetic enough for me to to do that. I'd prefer to do that with another book that I've read. And that's a bit damning. But we're on to two books that I won't say that I actively liked them. No, I, I liked these two books. I won't say that I actively recommend them. These are books that I'm happy to read, but... They have been done better in other books. Really good, actually. Monica Hesey. I've seen people call this book really average, actually, or really meh, actually. And that's fair. It's advertised as a book uh, along the sorrow and bliss type. But it's really nothing like sorrow and bliss. Because while sorrow and bliss blends the humour and the, the sad scenes and really sort of is able to get you quite down and bring you up quite quickly. This book is really funny. Then it's all about mental health and then it's funny again and it seems inappropriate. It's just not well blended. It feels like you're reading a comedy. It feels like you're reading a sad book and then it feels like you're reading a comedy again. It feels like Monica Hesey changed her mind on what genre she was writing twice in this book. A young woman gets married. She gets divorced. She acts with less brains than anybody has a right to do. Honestly, what... I found it really hard to empathise with anybody acting in such an intentionally self-sabotaging manner. I couldn't believe she was that stupid. Normally I'm a sucker for for these characters. Normally I'm like, oh, did you jump off a building and graze your knee? Oh, but this was just like, what did you expect would happen? It did make me laugh. I did stay attached to the characters. I did care about the ending. I was barracking for certain events. Even though I feel like this was only vaguely written in the real world, I do think that there is a good writer in Hesse somewhere. I actually think that, like, individual bits of this are quite... Like, individual paragraphs are really well done. I think, you know, she's been a successful writer and part of the team that created Shit's Creek. I think she's come in this to this with, like, a, I can definitely do this sort of attitude and she's definitely got the talent to do this. But what she hasn't been able to do is arrange her thoughts and ideas and the nice passages of writing into a coherent and a good novel yet. That seems like a relatively big thing but easy thing to correct. Much nicer things to say about Mother in the Dark by Kayla Maiori, although I do think this novel is a bit forgettable. This is the story of Anna and her mother who has the same name as her. They're members of an Italian-American family living in Boston, and most of this novel takes place in Anne's memory. We're really discussing her mother, who is basically chronically unhappy, almost certainly suffering from some sort of mental health issues, but we don't really know what. And she comes across as just a completely unfit mother. Anna's dad doesn't seem too much better, but he's clearly functioning and just a bit more of an asshole. Anna misses a call from her sister in the modern day timeline, and she leaves a message asking her to come home. And Anna is procrastinating, and we get to see Anna's life, where she is now. I guess there is this like intergenerational idea about personality, what we inherit from our parents. Obviously, the mother and daughter are, are meant to be similar characters. They share a name. They, they've got a lot of similar traits. There's trauma. There's a family secret. I, I was engaged. It, it wasn't bad. I actually really quite liked this, but yeah, completely forgettable. I always find nonfiction a little bit hard to categorize as a good book or a bad book. And An Immense World by Ed Yong is really a great example of this because I think that this is a fantastic book. But did it deliver what I wanted? Was I satisfied with this book? Do I give this book five stars? No, no, I don't. This is a nonfiction about how animals perceive the world. It's packed full of interesting facts. And I did learn some cool things like who has a better sense of smell, humans or dogs? 
And the answer to that really depends on how you measure it. Humans are actually better than dogs at differentiating between different smells. Well, dogs are better at smelling things that are far away. Dogs can smell a peanut from the opposite side of the house. Humans can tell the difference between a peanut and a sausage. I, I don't know. I don't know if dogs can do that too, to be honest. I don't know what, what dogs can't differentiate between. I kind of got really frustrated with this book, and I think that this is probably me getting frustrated with the reality of the world. There is a whole chapter discussing whether animals feel pain. And legitimately, who would suggest that they didn't? Who really thinks that animals don't feel pain? How would you ever come to that conclusion if there was no evidence for it, which there isn't? It was full of the assumptions scientists have made over the years that were just not based in reality. And I just cannot see how any scientist could make that assumption and not challenge it. And yet, this was apparently the norm. I've got a degree in physics, and if you make an assumption that big without challenging it, you should never work in physics again. But we have generations of animal biologists questioning whether they feel Like, this is not a discussion. If animals don't feel pain, that's the revelation. That's the thing that will blow my mind. What, what is different about animals that they don't feel pain? But that's not what's happening, is it? Animals do feel pain. And to have an entire chapter dedicated to trying to change my paradigm is trying to change my point of view. I don't need my point of view changed. It's blatantly obvious that animals feel pain. I've stepped on my dog's paw. I've seen him, you know, run into a wall. I've seen him bitten by a bee. He experiences pain. I really just expected this book to do so much more. I found brief snippets of it fascinating. I found brief snippets of it really, really interesting. The science is not at a level that I felt could blow my mind yet. As far as a non-fiction book is, is written, it's accurate, it's full of examples, it's considered, it's well constructed, it's well written. And if this is a topic that you are interested in, you should probably read it. If this is a topic that you're not interested in, uh, then I don't really see if it matters whether it's well written or not. Four books to go, and these are the four books that I think you should go out, you should buy, you should get from your library, you should consume these books. Soft, Sweet, Plenty of Rhythm, Laura Worrell. Circus Palmer is a trumpet-playing, 40-year-old, womanising, wannabe jazz star. Star is a generous word in that description. Pia is his ex-wife, mother of his daughter, and she is still in love with the idea of being in love with Circus. Maggie is the only woman who calls Circus Cyrus. She is pregnant with his child. Coco is the daughter of Pia and Circus. She's discovering boys, but she's discovering the wrong boys. She has what I think we could all agree on is uncharacteristically terrible taste in men. The best way to describe this novel is that it's really four interlinked coming-of-age stories. I don't want to say that this book is is fun. It's not, it's not fun. But it's very easy to get involved with the story. It's very easy to support these characters. It's very easy to want positive outcomes for them. Especially, I think, for Coco the daughter, who is a bit of an idiot in in all the all the all the most likable ways. She doesn't make good choices, but she's very young. And while you have these engrossing, engaging stories being told, there's themes and discussions around motherhood, fatherhood, unfulfilled dreams, unrealistic expectations, secrets, how well you know somebody. I really enjoyed the balance. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I'm really looking forward to seeing what Laura Worrell does next. This next book I think is incredible and I think that I probably like this book less than most people will like this and I, I think that this is um, an amazing book. The New Life by Tom Crew. Not that I didn't like this book by the way, I really like this book. I just think other people are going to like this book even more. A historical fiction set in Victorian England. Two men write a book about inverts. That is the Victorian word for men who prefer the company of men. And by company, I mean sex. Henry Alice's wife, Edith, has fallen in love with Angelica, 
but Angelica wants Edith all to herself. Don Addington is married to Catherine, but he meets Frank, a painter, and he moves in with them. They are the two men who are writing this book. They're the men that are advocating for a new life. I think this book is completely fantastic. I loved the scene where Catherine calls out John for being gay, and he talks about wanting to be loved and feel a connection with somebody, and she sort of says, no shit, but didn't you think about me? Didn't you think I would want those things too? And I, I love that. It just pointed out how women are the victims of homophobia too. And it is a point of view that I didn't expect discussed in a novel written by a man. And, and a man who I am assuming is a gay man, although I can see little evidence on Twitter to say that he is of any sexual preference. So I am assuming that he is gay. <laughs> Apologies if he is not. But I think it's really wonderful that an author can decenter themselves and decenter their point of view. It just allows them to discuss an issue with so much more complexity and so much more empathy to the characters around them. This is a book about male inverts and the whole time you're wondering what about female inverts? But Crew includes female inverts in the book, and he includes a discussion of, well, why are we talking about male inverts? Why are we not talking about female inverts? He really does explore this issue from all sides, and he doesn't neglect the story in doing it. This is, this is wonderful because it is historical fiction meets literary fiction meets queer fiction. It's smart, it's engaging, it's emotional, it's thought-provoking. Book a prize, anybody? That's certainly not unrealistic thing to say. It, it does, in some ways, give off vibes of Shuggy Bane, but at the same time, it gives off Victorian literature vibes. It gives off Oscar Wilde vibes. I mean, potentially because he is a bit part character in this book. A lot of people are going to like this book. A lot of people are going to have nice things to say about this book, and they're not going to be people who read the same sort of literature. I really like this book, and I, I think that other people will like this book much more than me. Mame by Jessica George, uh, another one that I predicted for the Woman's Prize long list, and I've got much nicer things to say about this one. I want to say that this gave me Queenie vibes, but it's considerably better than Queenie. Maddie lives in London. She is in her mid-20s. She's been caring for her father for years now. She's put her life on hold for a bit. She's still a virgin. She's not moved out of her house. Her brother has his own life and he spends money doing things like going to Japan, but he doesn't help out with his father's living expenses. He sort of always promises Maddie that just take it out of your savings and I'll catch you up later on. Maddie's mother is returning from Ghana to help. She's still married to Maddie's father, but she's not really still with him. She's, you know, she's been living in another country to him for the past few years. And I find this complex arrangement something really enjoyable and different to wrap my head around this we're together but we're not together sort of double talk thing but maddie's mother moving home is really her chance to move out and then once she's moved out a tragic event sort of forces everybody back together maddie's family really take her for granted so does maddie's work so do her friends so do the men she's interested in i really feel like this comes back to the issue of racism which is discussed in this book a, a little bit jessica george is intentionally showing us these injustices in maddie's life next to the racism that is going on. And you sort of can't help but to, to contrast and compare the two. It almost feels like these little injustices that she has with her mother and, and her brother and her father, it, it almost feels a metaphorical repetition of the racism she is experiencing in society. The human race is, is really a family, so why is it that the black girl is the one paying for everything? This novel is super feminist. It's about being black. It discusses trauma and grief, moving on with your life, caring for somebody who is disabled, giving yourself permission to be happy, how horrible dating is, how horrible flatmates can be, how wonderful dating can be, how wonderful flatmates can be. Uh, the same thing about, you know, employment. There is uh, a discussion around sex and pleasure or pain and how some women don't, don't have 
the most enjoyable sex lives and how that can make dating hard for them. And what I think is incredible is a lot of these issues, they're, they're quite big. They have the potential to sort of take you out of the book, but the writing really just keeps you in the story. It allows you to digest these issues and to enjoy the story at the same time. It doesn't dominate, nor does it feel secondary. It's a really well-balanced piece of literature. There's a lot of hype for this one, and can I tell you it's real? Go out, get yourself a copy. This is a very good book. But the best book in this list is Wade in the Water by Naomi Nakuma. I think this book is just so, so wonderful. It is nuanced and remarkable, and it it's blowing my mind. Every time I think about this book, I realize another thing that is done and I'm like, oh my God, another, how did, how did you put so many things into this book that just make me go, whoa. Alla is 11. She is living in the racially divided town of Ricksville, Mississippi in the 1980s. One day, Mrs. St. James moves in. She's a white woman and she is moved in to the black neighborhood, not the white neighborhood. And she becomes friends with Alla, who is 11. But that friendship is off. In the 1960s, Mrs. St. James was a teenager and our narrative switches between the two women and between the two timelines. I don't really want to tell you too much more about the plot. I could probably tell you quite a bit without spoiling this book, but I think it's more enjoyable to discover those little details on your own. I think the plot is just, it's, it's an engaging plot. It's a good plot. So I'm going to talk about the themes, and I suppose the big one that this is is racism. This book is about so much more than racism, but I feel like everything intersects with racism. It shows us racism from so many different angles, from so many different viewpoints. It shows us racism within relationship to, say, rape, within relationship to, of a, a family, within relationship of a business within relationship of a community. There are so many ways that this is discussed. It's not the big issue in any of those issues, but it's there, it's present. It's very, very well done. There are also times in this book when, when I felt like it was giving me To Kill a Mockingbird vibes. There were other times that I felt like I could have been reading The Help. There are quite a lot of books in the US that are written about race by white authors that are really popular books. And I've got to be honest, the two I named, I quite like both of those books, but it basically did those books in miniature form and just proved that they're better from a black person, that they're better from a black writer. It's just channeled it and completely blew the conversation that those books were channeling out of the water. Such a more nuanced, such a more detailed discussion that you could really understand the micro stuff, the little things. This was really the best possible way that an author could demonstrate to me that we need to read black authors when we are talking about racism. She she just made Harper Lee look simple. I think white authors often put black people down as passive people and, and I sort of then think of, say, Richard Wright's novel Native Son, where the black characters are anything but passive. They're still the victim of racism, even if they're not a character that you want to get behind and like. In this book, you have so many different black characters who are the victims of racism, and some of those black characters are not likeable, and some of those black characters are really easy to likeable, and most of those black characters are somewhere in between. This is literally mirrored in the way black characters think about white people in this book. Should black people trust white people? Well, there are some horrible ones, there are some good ones, and there is everything in between. You've just got to watch those ones that are in between. Another issue that was discussed in this book quite a lot was father-daughter relationships, family, nurture, love, and so on. How the father influences the daughter, how worshipping the father looks like in different situations. Every time I think about this book, every time I just realise that Nakuma has done something else, I cannot believe how complex this book is while remaining 
accessible, by being easy to easy to digest and not having the issues dominate the story, just having them be there, having them be there for you to see. They complement it. And the story, the story complements the issues. This is, it's just like a, a perfect marriage. This is what good storytelling, so what good literary fiction does. It takes a story, it takes an issue, and it just feeds them back into each other so that the issue makes the story stronger, the story makes the issue stronger. Oh, it's, it's, it's lovely. I think this is the sort of book that Toni Morrison would have sat down after reading and said, well, how did she do that? Because if this book is not successful, it's certainly not for lack of skill. It's certainly not for merit. In fact, if this book doesn't go absolutely big, I I'm, I'm, would just call the majority of the publishing world racist. This book should be everywhere. This this is the perfect book to flat out win the woman's prize. It it certainly should be shortlisted. If it if it hasn't been nominated, I'm I would really question the publisher. Absolutely incredible. It's got feminism, it's got class in it as well. This is a book that just keeps getting better and better in my mind. And you know, Black History Month, get yourself a copy. I guarantee you will not be disappointed with this book. I, I will hope to do a single book review on this, but honestly, every time I think about this book, there's like more issues that I want to discuss. I'm <laughs> really hard to, to frame your conversation when you, when you think about more things all the time. Um, that's all the books I've finished. Uh, just quickly, I'm currently reading What White People Can Do Next by Emma Dabiri and Independence by Chitra Banji. One of them is a non-fiction book about racism. The other one is a historical fiction set around Indian independence. Uh, early impression of both books is I like them, but it is early days yet. So anyway, that's the end of a long video. Thank you for watching. Let me know your thoughts on any of these books. Bye-bye.